Okay, well, um, welcome everyone. I'd like to um, just introduce you all to Dr. Mark Noble. Just super grateful that he's taken us a time with us, set aside two hours of his valuable time to meet with us and share with us a little bit more about Team CBT and the brain and how Team CBT really aligns with how the brain works to create emotional change. So Dr. Mark Noble is the professor of genetics and neuroscience at the University of uh, Rochester Medical Center. He's just a really cool guy and human being. Um, and the, I think you'll really see that today. He is best known for his work as one of the pioneering figures of stem cell biology. It sounds just super impressive. And I'm just amazed at how, how humble he is um, through this process of getting to know him. Um, his current laboratory is engaged in the development of improved treatments for traumatic injury to the nervous system, and just really looking for more effective and safer treatments for various types of cancer, and discovery of new molecular pathways involved in the development of the nervous system. I tried to really practice that statement, and it's still a bit of a tongue twister, <laughs> um, but I'd just like to give a little bit of uh, space now for... And Dr. Noble to share with you all a little bit more about himself, and then I'll jump into some starter questions for him to answer, and then we'll open it up to just a Q&A for the rest of you. We get to pick his brilliant brain. Oh, well, thank you, Diane, and Josh, thank you all for, for joining us for this. I hope very much that I can, I can at least partly justify your interest. This, I know the question that comes up um, a lot is, is, what in the world is a cellular and molecular biologist doing in this world? And that was really an accident of, of multiple events. We were working in my lab on rare genetic diseases that involve um, dysfunction of a part of the cell that functions as the stomach of the cell. These are really terrible childhood diseases. And a lot of what we do is we try and take uh, established drugs and find new uses for them. The idea being that if we start out with a drug that we know a lot about, then it's, and, and that's already approved for use, then the road to the clinic is much easier. And we made some interesting discoveries. We published a couple of nice papers. But what we have not published was a very disturbing discovery, which is that when you have a situation where this part of the cell is mildly dysfunctional, about 10% of the FDA-approved drugs that we looked at made things worse. And because the diseases where dysfunction in this part of the cell, it seems to be important, includes things like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, even aging. Then that was a matter of deep concern and of even greater concern was that a couple of the drugs at the top of the list were antidepressants. So that triggered my interest. And I, I knew that when we would publish on this, that I would have to get involved in discussions on treatments for depression about which I knew nothing. I've been interested in the brain for a very long time, but I have always found that attempts to understand depression and anxiety are, are unsatisfactory. So just, it was just one of those moments when if you are a believer in, uh, in uh, forces that we don't understand. Um, it, it was as though the universe reached in its hand and said, pay attention to this. Because as I was developing these interests, I received my monthly issue of the Stanford Alumni Journal. And that month there was an article, an interview with David Burns on his new high speed treatments for depression and anxiety. And it happened to be a time in my life when I was reviewing grants for the in, in person for the California Stem Cell Initiative, 
which meant that I was out in, in the Bay Area in California four or five times a year. And Stanford is my home base from, from graduate school. And I still have lots of friends there. So I got in touch with David. And he very graciously invited me to come and visit and to go on a Sunday hike and come to the Tuesday training group. And in that Tuesday training group, he, he showed the video, which I'm sure that many of you are familiar with, of the treatment session with Karen, who's, whose daughter uh, had gone outside to play and was shot in the face with, by a child with a high-powered air rifle. And at the end of that, when Karen went from the depths of depression to the heights of joy and said, what the hell just happened? That was it's just what I was sitting there wondering because there's nothing I had ever encountered in neuroscience that enabled me to understand what was going on. So I wanted to understand it. And that was the entry into my interest in Team CBT was the puzzle was, was so interesting. And after satisfying myself that this was a reproducible phenomenon, particularly with David's ability to get single session treatments, I decided to dive in fully. And the reason that was important is because if I, for, for me, the way my brain works, if I have to try and understand psychotherapy from the perspective of treatments that take months and people are changing their diets and their relationships and who knows what else is going on and change is slow and change is partial, I have no idea how to study that. But if you have treatment occur in two hours, everything you need to know occurs within those two hours. So that was a problem that I could look at to try and understand what in the, which is, I, I know the, the, the question for all of us who go into this world, which is what the heck is David doing? Because even people who were very well trained in Team CBT rarely have single session treatments. There are some people like Matt May and, and uh, a few others who can get treatments in a, in a few sessions. But, but what's, what's going on that makes David's two hour treatment so successful? And what can we learn from that to make other treatments so successful? And, and fortunately, what has happened, and I hope that people will benefit from today, is that as time went on, I was in California a lot, and I got to know Rhonda Borofsky. Rhonda started her new international training group, which is where I met Kate and, and Debbie and Rob Wiley and, and multiple others. And I asked Rhonda if I could join. And she told me that she would only let me join if I agreed to become a small group leader which I thought was ridiculous because everybody there is a trained therapist, but I love Rhonda and she insisted. So I said, sure, we'll give it a try. And it's turned out to be a fantastic way to find out what kind of explanations are helpful for people. So that every week when we have our small group sessions or even when we even have our large group sessions, I'll try and understand whatever we're working on from a, the point of view of brain function and, and succinctly present it and see if that's a helpful idea for people. And that way I learn what's helpful and what's not helpful and what's just me um, having um, hallucinations. And everybody helps me weed out the hallucinations, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so glad you agreed to be a small group leader in Rhonda's group because I've only heard good things about people wishing that they land in Mark's group so they could learn so much more from you because I think the beauty that you've brought to this process is you've really broken it down to helping us have a deeper understanding of what we're doing because we know certain parts were powerful, but we didn't really quite know why. And I know Dr. Burns has even said that himself where he says, I know positive reframing works. I'm not even quite sure why or how it works so well. And then until you came along, 
uh, we didn't quite know. And you, the gift that you've given us is just it's laid out in such a clear way. It's easy to digest. Like the brilliance of it is not like how complex your understanding is of the brain, but how you've made it really easy to understand and digestible. And you've really made Dr. Burns look even more brilliant. Well, that's, that's, thank you, Joanne. I mean, that's, my goal is, it's really very, I'm not going to say it's very simple because it continues to grow and grow. But when David and I, after, when I went on my, before I went on my first walk, I listened to whatever podcasts were available to that time and read Feeling Good and read other books. And I was walking with David and I told him about it, a, a guy I knew in, in, in my science world, um, a, a scientist by the name of Ed Taub. And Ed had discovered a long time ago a phenomenon called learned uselessness. What he discovered was that if you inject a nerve block into the shoulder of a monkey so that an arm is useless for a week, the monkey learns that arm is useless. So when you now remove the nerve block, the monkey's brain thinks the arm is useless and it continues to behave as though it's useless. Mm. Of you may already be thinking, well, it's like it's familiar. Uh, see things like this in the week. And Ed wanted to figure out how do you get the monkey to use its arm again? So he did a really cool, simple experiment. He took the other arm, the good arm, and he strapped it to the body so that the only way the monkey could feed itself was by using the arm its brain thought didn't work. And now it regained function over the course of a couple of days. And he developed this into a type of physical therapy that we call mass practice therapy. Now, mass practice therapy is astonishing and what it can do for people with strokes and kids with cerebral palsy and all sorts of circumstances. And those of us who were following Taub's work were amazed by this, but in his field, people were not taking him seriously. And then what happened was they did some studies where they did some brain imaging. Okay, by this point, Taub had taken people like classical musicians who had lost use of one of their arms and helped them regain performance status of function. Wow. He had helped athletes who had, he had equally severe injuries get back on the playing field. But people really paid attention when somebody did some imaging studies and found some changes in the brain. Well, of course there were changes in the brain. People had recovered function. So what did you expect to see? But people took that seriously. And you know, what, what is needed for Team CBT to undergo that kind of phase shift out in the community? And one of the, and what I've been trying to figure out is, I don't want to say remove the magic, but see the magic more clearly. Because for any therapy at all, the only reason it works is because it is aligned with the biology of the problem you're trying to solve. So if team CBT works so well, it's because it is aligned with the biology of emotions and brain function. And that was what I set out to try and figure out, which is why we're here today. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you see team really aligns with the brain, specifically breaking down each phase of the T, E, A, and M. Sure. So, so one of the things that, so th there's a couple of different ways that people approach a scientific problem. And one way is to start with the most complicated information that you have, and then try and use that to figure out what's going on. So that was where I started because that's the world that I live in. So let's look at parts of the brain and pathways and dopamine and serotonin and noradrenaline and cortisol and uh, all these ideas about higher order processing and what is consciousness and 
what are emotions, you know, all this complicated stuff that very smart people study. And none of it was helping me. So I just took a step back and said, okay, I need a simpler starting point, which is what are emotions? Why do we have them? What's their purpose? Where did they come from? If you try and understand that from the perspective that most people do, which is to start with the human and then try and work backwards and say, well, we, we think apes have emotions and we think monkeys have emotions and maybe dolphins have emotions. And it, you know, it kind of looks like cats and dogs and horses have emotions, but we're not really sure. Then, then you're trying to find these, these boundaries between species. I looked at it a different way and said, what do emotions do? By and large, with the, old, with the sole exception of surprise, I think, emotions cause us to move towards something or away from something. That is a problem that had to be solved for the simplest cell. Is something going to be dangerous for me or is something going to be good for me? Is it a nutrient? Is it a toxic chemical? So does a cell have emotions? We have no idea, but we know it expresses these behaviors. And as organisms became more complex and you started having nerve cells, this happened more quickly. And as the course of evolution went on, you had bundles of nerve cells that were collectively organized to do certain tasks. And eventually you got to species with more complicated brains. And when you approach it that way, what you find is that looking at fish, for example, a lot of the circuitry that we think is aligned with emotions is already there. And the transmitters are identical. And the transmitters are so identical that you can give um, crawfish benzodiazepines and they express the kind of behavior that you associate with humans given benzodiazepines. So these are, these are constancies. So that's a neat place to start. Okay, so, that, so we have emotions to move towards or away. What else does the brain do? The brain, like any organ in the body, keeps us alive. That is its primary function, to help keep us alive. The way it does that is it gets information, it interprets that information, and it makes predictions. I think that that may be the key concept. The brain is a prediction machine. Why? Because predictions are what you figure out to know whether to move towards or away from something. So you make a prediction. And then how do you get motivated to do that? Well, you use these things that we happen to call emotions that are our powerful motivators. That is the core of CBT, of Buddhism, of Stoicism, is that basic concept. But I think all of them, without talking about it, but Team CBT, with a much more attention to this, takes in the necessary next step. And I think this is at the core of understanding the power of Team CBT. We often make the wrong interpretations and that's a disaster because then we make the wrong predictions. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about crossing the street or whether you think that sound is from a tiger. If you make the wrong interpretation and say, oh, there's no cars coming, or no, I don't think that's a tiger, and you turn out to be wrong, there's a good chance you're gonna die. That's not a good outcome. So there's a quality control step to reevaluate. And if you are wrong, your brain changes the interpretations. And if you change the interpretations, you change the predictions and your emotions change instantaneously because that is how the brain works. There is no magic to rapid emotional change. It's how the brain works. And we've all experienced that many times. So for example, let's say, um, let's say you're walking down the hall and you see Tyanne and you, you wanna to speak to her so much because she's so wonderful and you have something that you really wanna talk with her about. So you go up to her, you start talking to her and she ignores you. She walks on by. 
her mind is somewhere else. She pays you no attention. So you have emotions. You have, you, feel, you may feel hurt, you frustrated. You may feel betrayed or angry. You take it all very personally. But let's say that three minutes later, you find out that Ty Ann had just received some very disturbing letter about who knows what. And all of a sudden, your thoughts change and your emotions change because now you're concerned about Tayyip. And your emotions have flipped that quickly. I think that is at the core of every method that we use in Team CBT is setting up that comparison. And that's something that, that, that we can explore because I think it is, is essential to understanding what it is we're trying to achieve. And I think there's another part for us to make sure to discuss, which is also critical in Team CBT, which is everything is very well thought out to not activate a fight or flight response. And that is very critical in our education. And, and, I, and I, what I found is that, that that helps people understand the reasons why you do certain things and not other things. That was a long-winded answer, but I, I, I hope that's part, at least partly helpful. No, I think that was really, um, really super helpful. And I was even wanting more of, of what you were sharing about. So um, I love how you talk about just human beings. We make interpretations and predictions about the world and actually our emotions serve a purpose as motivators for us to engage in the world for survival, to move towards or away from something, right? And you talked about that rapid emotional change is then just a natural part of how the brain works and all of our tools then allows us to move towards effective emotional change for the brain um, as we reinterpret things differently or predict things differently. And I was wondering if you could dive even more deeply into breaking down T, E, A, and M and how each of those components actually um, really align with the brain changes that we need. Because um, I, I remember reading, you talked about like empathy helps to first like create acceptance. But before we do that, we're rating our, our emotions and that gives us a sense of just awareness and then empathy creates a sense of safety and acceptance, just like you were talking about, like easing the fight or flight. Um, but I was wondering if you could dive in even more um, of each of those phases of team and how that really aligns with, uh, sure. with the brain. Sure. Let, let, let's, let's start with, with fight or flight. So nothing that we do in the course of evolution was based upon whether or not someone's gonna accept or turn down our invitation to the prom, whether or not we're gonna like this television show or this restaurant or stuff like that. It was about, do we live or do we die? And as Rob correctly pointed out, this fight, flight or freeze, but I, I, I think of freeze as part of the, the, this, whole, this whole thing. Fawn, maybe, Kate, maybe. I have to think about that. The, um, in the brain, what's happening? When you are faced with a threat, regardless of what species you are, your attention narrows. Because everything that's going to happen next depends on your, everything in your life depends on your survival. So, if you are faced with a threat, you do not have time to worry about whether you're going to make it to the movies two days from now or what, whether you've got ice cream in the freezer or need to stop at the store. You need to get away or you need to fight or you need to become inconspicuous. And your tension is super narrow. When you look at brain function in people with depression and anxiety, what you see is that parts of the brain that respond to threats are already set up to be on a hair trigger. 
And you know that from working with your clients, they, uh, they are under a lot of stress. The world is a very dangerous place for them, a very harmful place for them. And they're trying to figure out how to survive this. They may not talk about it this way, but the parts of their brain that are evolutionarily there to protect us from threats, they're saying danger, 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 and the brain acts accordingly. And part of what happens in that is that one of the chemicals that released is cortisol. When you inject cortisol into an animal, you increase the function of the parts of the brain that respond to danger signals, and you decrease the part function in a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in quality control. And you decrease the communication between this. So what's pretty typical in depression and anxiety in, in imaging studies is to see that the communication between people usually study a part of the brain called the amygdala, that the communication between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex is, is different than it is in people without depression or anxiety. And it's different in a way that shuts down the quality control, the reinterpretation, the thinking, what we call thinking, although we'll get back to that. So what does testing do? Even the brief mood survey, what are you doing? You're asking the person to pay attention to their emotions, to put them in terms of words and to put them in terms of numbers. You're actually forcing an interaction between emotional parts of the brain and cognitive parts of the brain. And you're making it easy for them. And that's also a critical issue. You're making it super easy for someone to describe their emotional state. And you're not asking them to come up with the words themselves. And we all know that, that when, we're, when we're stressed, when we're depressed, it can be hard to even think of the words that we want to use to, to talk about how we're feeling. But here are the words right in front of you. So in this very simple form, you've started the process of changing the type of connections that are going on in the brain, of providing information in a stress-free way. It makes it easy for your client to provide that information. Then you're going to go to empathy. And I, early on in this journey, I, I remember this clearly. I, I had been trying to understand empathy and, and the neuroscience community really is interested in empathy and all this work on things called mirror neurons, which may or may not exist and all these papers on empathy. And what people were studying by and large was empathy from the point of view of the giver. How do you perceive a state in another person? And that didn't make sense to me. And I was on one of the Sunday hikes and Rhonda and I were walking along and I said, look, I'm really confused by empathy. To me, empathy only matters from the point of view of the receiver, not from the giver. And we started talking about that and things started becoming clearer. So what does empathy do? Well, we all know that it's about acceptance and that's important. We are generating a safe space and that automatically is going to turn off the fight or flight response. You can't keep it. Well, it's hard to keep that response mobilized if you're in a safe space because you don't need it anymore. So your attention can now change. It does more than that though. And part of that has to do with st the storytelling aspect of it. But another part of it has to do with why we do empathy the way we do. I, we all know um, Burns rule number one, and we all know how hard it is to follow that rule. Do not try to help. So why is that so important? And what is, seems clear to me is that 
trying to help is an attack. Trying to help is saying to someone so much smarter than you are. You're so dumb. You didn't even think of this, I'll bet. What are you going to do? You're going to activate fight or flight, and now you're back in this narrow perception. person doesn't trust you anymore. So we don't do stuff like that. We're trained to do language matching because we have no idea what a word means to somebody else. So we might use a word that to us is completely innocuous, but for someone else is a trigger word that activates fight or flight, and now you're back with that problem again. So when we are saying back to someone what it is, our understanding of what they're, they're telling us, we, we match their words and we try and match their, even their, if you listen to David very closely, even their, their tonal structure. And in doing all this, we get at one of the critical aspects, I think we get at one of the critical aspects of how do you change the brain? So we believe we, we really don't have any other way to think about it at, at this moment in time, that all of our thoughts, our emotions are based upon networks of nerve cells acting together. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to teach, people are trying to learn a different way of using those networks. And we're trying to do that very specifically and all the evidence indicates that the only way to mod in that in order to modify a specific network of nerve cells, you have to activate it. Well, you know, theoretically, we could know if a network was activated by putting lots of electrodes in someone's head and putting them in a scanner and, and doing all sorts of science fiction-y things that we actually have no idea how to do. But we also have this other tool the at um, is much more powerful of just asking them, right? Because if they talk about it, you know you've activated that network of nerve cells. So it's not only that you've gotten the information that you're going to use later on in the session, but you're actually starting the process of activating specific nerve cell networks. Okay, addressing resistance is also, I mean, that's a particularly complex thing to discuss. I'm just thinking, no, I don't want to skip over these parts of empathy. The, 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 the quantification of what we're doing is, is so critical. So when you ask someone to give you a grade, it's not just that you're doing another check on empathy you're doing a very careful quantitative test where the difference between an A and an A minus is really meaningful to you because it tells you you've missed something. There are circuits you haven't activated, this part of the story to tell. So that's, that's super clever. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's really quite remarkable how clever this all is. I mean, and David has been working this out on the basis of what works, but when you look at it from what works from the perspective of brain function, it's, it's just super insightful. So you ask this question, you ask the question of are you ready to move forward? You're not pushing anything. So you're not activating fight or flight. You're not pushing on resistance. You're not forcing someone to go somewhere they don't wanna go. Like virtually every other therapist and every other person in their life has been telling them to do for years and where all the ruminating voices in their head that are bullying them all the time have been telling them to do for years you're giving them a choice. That's an, another bit of what keeps things safe and, and interactive. Okay, so addressing resistance, you all know, is the daily mood log. And, you know, I, I, I wrote this, this 15,000 word, I think, guide to the daily mood log simply because when I was doing the, the last podcast I did with David and Rhonda, I was so relaxed. They, uh, I said what I was thinking, which is that I think that the daily mood log is the most brilliant invention in the history of psychology. And then I thought, oh, my goodness, my colleagues are going to listen to that and think I've completely lost my mind. And I'm talking about a three pieces of paper as the greatest invention in history of psychology. So I thought I better do a deep dive on this. And after I did a deep dive on it, 
I thought, yeah, actually, that's what I believe is that it's one of the greatest inventions in the history of psychology. So that's all downloadable from that particular podcast. So what does a daily mood log do? It makes things easier again. Instead of being faced with a mountain, instead of saying, having this, this terrible challenge of, oh my God, we're going to try and solve 30 years or 40 years of depression and anxiety and I've been so miserable. We're just going to work on one day. Well, that's a lot less stressful. So that's, that's something that's approachable. It's not a giant mountain anymore. And then what do you do? You start with the top of the page with all the emotional language. So again, people are describing their emotions now in more detail, again, quantitatively, again, without having to come up with the words themselves. And then you ask the question of trying to identify the negative thoughts that are associated with any emotion, which they choose. You're not going to push any one of them. Again, very well thought out. You're never going to activate fight or flight. People are going to talk about whatever they want to talk about and start letting them discover the negative thoughts. That's another critical part of what we do, that it's not just that we don't try to help. Even when we're asking people to do something that's, that they don't know how to do, like positive reframing or identifying negative thoughts, we're helping them to discover that themselves. And it turns out that when you study learning, the differences between being taught something and discovering something are night and day. And it doesn't matter whether you're working with kids or adults. If the person who's trying to learn something learns it by discovery, they've got it. And if you just tell them what it is, usually they don't get it. And, uh, I'm so glad to have that particular excuse for my miserable academic performance for so much of my life. The ability to do that and to take your time and to just be gentle about that and helping people discover activates more of these nerve cell networks that are gonna try and modify. So now you're getting all these networks up, up into the, the conscious awareness, things that you can work on. And then you ask your magic button questions. And in doing things like this, you're using surprise. Remember I mentioned before that surprise is the one emotion that's not towards or away. Surprise is pay attention. I didn't predict this. This is something I wasn't ready for. Could go negative, could go positive, but what surprise says is pay attention. We're gonna solve all my problems by working on a single moment in time. You're gonna give me the option of pressing a magic button to make all this pain go away. And then you're gonna, then we're gonna arrive at the conclusion that that may not be a good idea, but you have a better idea. This is all really surprising for people. And, and it's part of why I wrote this, this new shorter guide that, that I wrote, which is to try and, because some, one, somebody in our Wednesday groups said they needed something for their clients because Team CBT is so different from other forms of therapy. And people were saying, well, why, why are we doing this? And this is so different. I don't understand it. So there's that, that, that new guide that, uh, Tyann, you have the newest version of that can go out to everyone. The, okay, so now you're going to move into positive reframing. Surprise, again, you're telling me that being so depressed or having this addiction or being so angry at myself or my partner is saying something good and wonderful about me? I didn't predict that. So that's something to pay attention to. And then as you do that and letting people discover that, you're helping them to feel better about themselves. Because instead of having that voice in their head saying they're not good enough, 
they're turning on other voices. They at, are saying these other better things. Okay, that's part of how learning occurs. I mean, we didn't acquire all these voices that tell us we're not good enough out of nowhere. They, we got them from people in our lives, parents, grandparents, siblings, school. I got a lot of them from school teachers personally, um, saying that, you know, you're not, you're not good enough. And you learn that stuff. And they tell you that because they learned it from somebody else who learned it from someone else. And it's all just these stories that we have in our heads. Okay, so now we're gonna start very gently changing those stories. And this goes to the heart of my concerns about rumination. That rumination is a manifestation among other things of confirmation bias. And we know that that is one of the hardest problems in treating people is that they will interpret everything consistently with the stories about what's wrong with them. They will not see the good things, they will amplify the bad things, all the cognitive distortions that we learn about. So how do you defeat confirmation bias? This is something that psychologists have worked on a lot. And the most powerful way to defeat confirmation bias is with something called desirability bias. So what have you done? You said, here's all these way, here's ways in which you're, here's all these ways that you can discover about things that are right about you, that are good about you. That's really desirable. That makes people feel good. So you're actually harnessing, I think, maybe, harnessing rumination for your benefit because you're using desirability bias to create these circuits so that every time someone thinks a negative thought, you're trying to train them so the reaction is, oh, but that says that I'm honest, that I care about other people, that I have strong values, that I want to succeed, I'm highly motivated, all these other things that we discuss. Now, David discusses what's going on there and what goes on when you now move to the magic dial in terms of doing a negotiation with the subconscious. And I like the phrase, but in one of our early discussions, you know, my question was, what are you negotiating about? And David said, I have no idea. So I thought, okay, what, what are you negotiating about? So, I think there may be a couple of things going on. W one of the negotiations that I can, that I speculate about is this issue of predictions. The brain's a prediction machine. Prediction is more important to us than anything. And you all know, you all know that a person would rather make unhappy predictions than no predictions at all. And we know that is true even for mice. Much worse than misery is uncertainty. Our brains do not handle chaos and neither do the brains of our evolutionary ancestors. Chaos eliminates predictability and if you eliminate predictability, you eliminate the ability to know what to do. So what we were doing previously in cognitive and behavioral therapy, I think I'm speculating here, is by going in and going right after the cognitive, dis cognitive distortions, we know for some people that worked fine, but for a lot of people it didn't. Maybe part of the reason for that is that we were removing their predictability apparatus. All the interpretations that they had, this is the way the world's gonna work. We're saying, oh, no, 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 no. You're just, you're wrong about all that. But we weren't giving anything to replace it. Doing the positive reframing first creates a replacement. The, the way that I think about it is that 
if you have a chair that has four legs on it and you take away one leg, the chair is very unstable. So let's say one of those legs is our negative thoughts for which you're gonna take it away by identifying cognitive distortions. If we give the positive reframe first, we've added a fifth leg to the chair. We've made it more stable. So going after the cognitive distortions, instead of being scary and thinking, oh God, I knew my brain was screwed up. It's, wait a minute, I've got all these good things about myself. And oh my, oops, sorry, I got a little enthusiastic there, hit my computer, that the, the negative stuff I've been telling myself isn't even correct. So now you're going back to those same networks of nerve cells you've been modifying and you're setting things up in the brain so that when you activate a network, not only are you activating these positive reframe thoughts, you're also activating the connected networks of identifying cognitive distortions. And what have you set up? You've set up quality control. You've set it up so that the brain can be looking at one interpretation versus another interpretation, one set of predictions versus another set of predictions. And you've set it up so that the brain is just going to do its job. It's going to choose the more accurate interpretations and predictions because that's what keeps you alive. And even the way the daily mood log is set up, it is, it's magnificent by having that column where you have your negative thoughts and how much you believe them. And then in that same row, you have your positive thoughts. And in that same row, you have your cognitive distortions so that you're actually looking at all that all at the same time. And it may be, and I, you know, it's, I, I, I'm very, I try to be very respectful of, of, of the many smart people who are trying to figure out these important problems. And, and as you know, there are a, a lot of people who take very seriously the, the, this tool of, of EMDR, or as David calls it, eye jiggling. And I, you know, like David, I was very, very cautious about any enthusiasm for this. It's really echo to me. Except there's a lot of good studies going on on what happens during the process. And it turns out that that movement of your eyes from side to side is what happens in REM sleep. And that is the part of sleep that is very important in consolidating new learning. And what people have found is that you can approximate that same kind of consolidation by going for a walk where your eyes are naturally moving from side to side or by doing EMDR. For whatever reasons, that triggers a consolidation step in the brain. So I now take that a bit more seriously. And, it, and it's, it's curious to me, interesting to me, that the entire physical structure of the daily mood log actually facilitates that movement of your eyes from one side to the other, and one side to the other, going back and forth all the time. Who knows whether it's relevant, but it's, it it's, it's, seems intriguing. Okay, so then what do we do in methods? So far as I can tell, every single method is about setting up the quality control. You know, we know that a method that works for one people may not work for someone else. And we have all these methods and that's part of the great power of team CBT is everyone's had different experiences and we wanna to respond to them individually. But when you take apart each of those methods, what are they doing? Externalization of voices is the, maybe the most dramatic example because you're putting those two interpretations out in the world right in front of you. And you're going back and forth with your client voicing each one until they learn how to crush the negative thought. What are you doing? You're, you're doing the quality control step. But the same is true for externalization and resistance. And the same is true for semantic reframing. And the same is true for Socratic questioning. And the, so far as I can tell, the same is true for every single method. 
you're just trying to cost benefit analysis, triple paradox. So what you're trying to do is to set up the quality control analysis without forcing it on someone, letting them engage in it and trusting that their brains are gonna work. So reasonable question is why do I think that this is at all a reasonable way to think about things? Thinking about things in this way seems to me that it may solve the problem in psychology that many people are worried about, which is called the weird problem in psychology. And no, Kate, that's not named after by psychologists who were trying to figure out what was going on in my mind. It's an abbreviation for Western educated industrial rich democracies which is where almost all the psychology studies are done. So our database is very biased, even more biased towards college students, as it turns out. So countering that, you have the work of people like the extraordinary Dixon Chibanda, who is in Zimbabwe. And if you do not know about his work, then Go in and type in the Friendship Bench Project and you'll find him. He's one of the only active psychiatrists in Zimbabwe. He was given the task of trying to help improve mental health in this country with no resources. And the only people he was given to work with were some grandmothers from the villages. And he said, wow, what a great opportunity. Because he had he'd noticed before that people would come to village grandmas to talk and to find out what to do. So basically he taught the grandmothers how to do cognitive and behavioral therapy and set up these benches. And this is an example of how important words are when we're doing our word matching during empathy, for example, throughout the session. He set up these benches they originally called the mental health benches. Nobody came. Trigger word, bad, stigma. So they called them the friendship bench. And now people started coming. And in very careful studies, controlled studies, blinded studies, even in these situations, these tools are working well, so well that friendship benches are being set up around the world. And they haven't even incorporated positive reframing and things like that yet. So this is part of what, what, what drives my desire to, to simplify things is to make it easier to learn them. So it's not just how can people like us, people who have been through a lot of education and have studied all this stuff can learn this. Can we get it, can we identify the processes that are so core to make it easy for others to learn this. And why would we do that? Because how are we gonna penetrate different communities? So there's a wonderful project out in Los Angeles, I think is called the Confession Project. And it's really how to create psychological change within the African-American community in Los Angeles. Well, do you teach the teachers? Do you bring in new therapists? Do you train therapists? No, you teach the barbers because that's where everybody goes to talk. And it's working fantastically. And that's the way in which I want to understand all this is to be able, because I, mentioned in the podcast I did with David and Rhonda that one of the things that motivates me is that I am very angry about our use of very powerful mind-altering chemicals in young children. I'm very angry about treating eight-year-old kids with antipsychotics and changing their mental function. Because 
part of what I study is how the brain develops. And you know, you know, these are chemicals that can change brain development. It's not a good idea. How do we educate the teachers? How do we educate the teachers to know that when Johnny is having a fit and he's eight years old and he's uncontrollable, instead of sending him to the counselor who doesn't know what to do, who's going to send him to a doctor and get him linked up with antipsychotics or antidepressants, well, Johnny's acting out. And what does acting out mean? It means you don't know the words. It's like, that's why we act out in charades. We're not allowed to share the words. Johnny doesn't have the words. Johnny's limbic system is saying something's wrong, something's wrong. You got to pay attention. Oh my God, I need help. And instead of giving help, instead of saying, hey, Johnny, what's wrong? Let's talk. We push Johnny away and we say, we don't want to see those emotions. And we're going to send you to another office and get you out of the classroom because we don't like you here. And then we're going to give you all these drugs that when you talk to many kids after they've been taking them and they, you ask them how they are, they say, I'm dead. How do we change that? And everything that we're trying to do is about answering questions like that. As you work with your clients to help them improve their lives and you improve your abilities to do this, you're teaching more people how to do this. We have people here who are with our, with our group today who are working with troubled students in schools to bring this information to school counseling, into the school systems, to try and increase awareness of this. But if we try and teach this by saying, well, yeah, I mean, you can learn this. I mean, you can sign up for, you know, you can join the, the weekly podcasts on Wednesdays and on the training groups on Wednesdays and Tuesdays, and you can listen to the 300 podcasts. I know David has written this 500 page book, but that's one of 11 books that you can read. Nobody wants to do that. There's a big activation barrier. So I thought, okay, something that maybe I can do is write this simpler stuff that hopefully is, is helpful to members who are learning the therapy. What are we trying to do? Why do we do certain things? Why do we do things in a certain way, but also creates an easy entry for others so that instead of it being this incredibly difficult thing to learn, we can simplify the concepts in a way so that others can learn them. Well, that was a long answer. Tyanne, you clearly activated a whole set of nerve cell networks in my head that are connected to each other. So I, uh, I apologize, I just went on like that, but um, that, that, that's kind of the, the picture for me of how these pieces fit together. Yeah, I am just feeling an immense amount of gratitude that you went into the depth that you did with the monologue and that it triggered those neural networks. Um, I don't know if you're able to see the comments, but I was glued to the screen myself, just fascinated and taking in all of the information that you were sharing. And people are saying like, this is fascinating. Um, Mark is magnificent. And we're trying to take notes, but we're glad there's a recording so we can go back and see all oh, of this so rich information. Yeah. So I'm still so inspired by your heart and passion for this. I know when I've talked with you personally, you just said, what, what drives me is just, there's just so much suffering in the world. And if I could just play a part in helping to relieve some of that suffering in some way, um, it just feels really meaningful. And I could see that in your passion as you were talking about the kids. And um, while one treatment is the medications, it just affects brain development long-term. And you're passionate about finding something long-term that's healing, that could bring more joy and quality of life for people, not this deadness that we often see when um, they've been on a, a medication long-term. Right. So, so thank you so much for that. And 
people are saying in the chat, like, um, thank God you did go into the depth that you did. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so nice. Thank you. Yeah, I just felt really inspired by the way you broke down each step too. And it was just so fascinating. Like, oh, wow, testing actually decreases stress because the words are there and it creates awareness of their emotions connecting the amygdala, the emotion part to the prefrontal cortex, the words. Like, I've never understood it in that way, but it just made it so much more powerful and meaningful. That's why we do that step. That's why we do that step. So, yeah, so there's, there's something else that, 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 that David and I have been talking about. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you, all, you all know David's views on mindfulness, that when he's being very careful, he'll say, well, you know, I don't know, and it seems to help some people. And other times he'll say, oh, this is just, who cares? But what is mindfulness? That there is a lovely... Um, YouTube recording that you can find, which is a visit between Aaron Beck and the Dalai Lama. And at a point in this conversation, the Dalai Lama asks Beck to, to give him a demonstration of, of a really powerful change that he helped create. And Beck says, well, there was this fellow scientist who came to see me, a very famous scientist, who was sure that this was his year to win the Nobel Prize. And he didn't get it. It went to others. And he knew that was it. Now he'd never get it. And he went into a terrible depression. And he came to see me. And I asked him how depressed he was. And he said, 100%. I mean, this is, I've been working for this my whole life. And I, now I'm never going to get it. So Beck said, huh, that's interesting. So that's 100% important to you. Do, do, do you have a, a family? I said, yeah, I do. He said, how important is your family to you compared to this? He said, well, you know, 20%. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Do you have any kids? And he said, oh, yeah, I have two kids. I really love them. He said, no, so how important is the, uh, are your kids to you? Oh, he said, oh, absolutely. I mean, at least 80%. And Beck said something like, oh, so that's interesting. So that's 100% plus 20% plus 80%. And the guy according to the way Beck tells it, just started sobbing. I said, oh my God, this is just what my father used to do to me, to pay attention to his work and not attention to me. And this is what I've been doing to my kids. And he was cured. And the Dalai Lama said, that's really interesting. We have a similar technique that we use. It, and Beck said, what's that? He said, well, it's called analytical meditation. It goes, well, that's interesting. When did you develop that? And Dolly Lama goes, about 3,000 years ago. Stop these comparisons. Now, analytical meditation is a type of meditation that is supposed to be much harder to learn than regular meditation. It's a further deep dive but maybe we're studying the same principles. I think we are. I think what, we're, what, what David has developed and all the people who've worked on this and contributed to it is a way of getting to the same endpoints in a much more direct manner. And there's another part of this that I've been thinking about a lot. And, and then I also think it's important understanding what we're doing. What we call thinking is mostly reflex. So the brain has two modes of thought, which um, Daniel Kaufman and Amos Tversky categorized as, they call it system one and system two thinking, but now Kahneman more, it makes it more easy to understand. They call it fast thinking and slow thinking. Fast thinking is what we do. 98% of what we do is fast thinking. 
Fast thinking is the networks that are there. They're the things we already know. They're the stories we already have. That's critical because if you know how the story goes, you make your prediction way more quickly and you have a much better chance of surviving. So, and besides, who wants to pay attention to all this stuff that's going on all the time, every day, every moment of our lives? That's impossible. You'd just be paralyzed. So most of what goes on in our brain is rapid thinking. When you start paying attention to yourself, it's amazing how much we do this. I mean, I find myself that I'm catching myself all the time these days when one of my colleagues asks me a question about an experiment and I have a quick answer. I think, oh my goodness, I did it again. That was rapid thinking. I did not do the slow analytical stuff of slow thinking, which is how you solve problems and how you learn. And what are we doing? We are engaging our clients in slow analytical thinking, which is essential for problem solving and learning. During the whole empathy part, they're, you know, they're telling their story, it's everything's connected together. You know, they may be thinking about some things, but mostly they're doing rapid thinking. If they're in fight or flight, they're almost always doing rapid thinking. And then we're giving them surprises and puzzles and changing their predictions and letting them discover. And we're having them write things down, right? So even at the level of motor control and paying attention to what they're writing, we're doing things that force their attention in certain ways, which by the way, is one of the reasons why you should, I think, never forego writing in your sessions because it's a part of how you focus attention how you get your client to focus attention on what, whatever it is you're working on. Our brains, human brains, our attention is 60% visual system oriented. Very different than dogs, which is mostly olfactory, or bats, which is mostly auditory. Or is mostly visual. And that focuses attention. And when you focus attention, learning is much more effective. So, Never, Rob asks, never what, please? Never skip the writing part. And I know that's hard because some people like to work in, in therapy sessions where they're going for walks outside with their clients. But say so you really want to go with the writing, which leads me to a thought about homework, which is something that we talk about, we've been talking about quite a bit in some of our sessions. When you look at cognitive and behavioral therapy as it's traditionally done, homework compliance is not very good. And why is that? Well, David has his list of 35 reasons why people don't do their homework. Yet, those are stories. Those are, those are just stories. Those are stories that... Um, I don't have time and I'm too busy and this happened today and it was too much. Why don't you do your homework? Because it's unpleasant. What is cognitive and behavioral therapy? I'm sorry, okay. Mark, I was okay. muting the background noise and accidentally also muted you. Oh, you muted me, okay. So, so why don't you do cognitive and behavioral therapy homework? Because it's not fun. It feels terrible. Here's all my negative feelings. Here's all my negative thoughts. And oh my God, I'm so stupid that my negative thoughts are all distorted thinking. Who wants to do that? What an unfun thing to do. In contrast, if you make sure before you get to the point where you're giving homework, even in the very first session, did you get to the point of getting into positive reframing? Now you've put this positive part of the homework in place and change the experience. So you've ended the session on, even if you end at that point with positive reframing, you've ended the session on a high note and you've created a homework assignment that's actually pleasant to do. And if it's pleasant to do, well, then, you know, if it's, if it's unpleasant, you're gonna avoid it because why? it activates fight or flight. It's not a fun thing to do. You don't wanna be there. So make it a place that you wanna be. 
again, positive reframing is, is I think critical in doing that. And I think all these steps are critical in moving from rapid to slow thinking, which I also think of as changing the script, right? What's rapid thinking? Rapid thinking is the stories. It's the scripts we have in our head. It's the autopilot that we're just gonna run on. If we're gonna change, we've gotta get out of the autopilot. We do that by moving to slow thinking, modifying nerve cell networks. And you can look at Team CBT from that point of view also, that everything we're doing is about changing the script. Right from the point where, you're gonna, where you say, we're gonna work on one moment in time. Well, that's not the script of psychotherapy to you're gonna to learn to identify your negative thoughts to positive reframing, everything that we do, we're changing the script, which I think, by the way, what is why five secrets are so effective in relationship issues, because what are you doing? You're changing the script. Instead of responding in the way that the other person predicts you're gonna respond and triggering this, <laughs> you did this, no, you did that, and it was your fault, no, it's your fault. You come in with a disarming response and you say, you know, you're right. And I, and God, I, I feel really embarrassed and, and sad and a little bit guilty about that because I care so much ab about you. And, you know, and you, you, you know, you're probably feeling that I've been ignoring you and you have just flipped the script. And if you flip the script, You've gotten into a state where the other person has to pay attention because now their predictions are not working anymore. You've gotten them to a new space. I think, but who knows? Yeah, that's the element of surprise again, right? Um, Dr. Noble, you had just two more questions before we open it up to the rest of the group. So you talked about don't forego the writing and how important that is to keep them focused. And when we're doing telehealth, do you feel like typing or screen sharing is equally effective or like it's really important for them to type it up or write it up as well? I think they have to type it up. Typing, is typing equally effective as if they were I, writing? I, yeah, because you're focusing your visual attention. You're doing the steps of thinking about word choices. What does a word mean? How do I spell this word? Why would I use this word rather than that word? So you're, it's, a, it, it's a very, very th slow thinking kind of process by its very nature. And the writing is part of what reinforces learning, which we all remember from school, right? You listen to a lecture, unless you're particularly exceptional, you don't learn very much. But if you take notes and you, you know, maybe write flashcards and stuff like that, it's way more effective. Definitely. Um, and we just had one question from uh, the webinar advertisement that people were interested in that I wanted to make sure we covered. And so we're talking about creating effective emotional change. And then we're curious as well as to how Team CBT then can be effective for um, physical symptoms like irritable bowel sy syndrome or chronic pain. Can you go a little bit more into that before we open it up? And I do see your hand raised, Rob, and we'll definitely open it up to sure, questions. Ab ab absolutely. I, 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 gosh, I, I love those, those, air, those, those puzzles to try and understand. So mm -hmm. chronic pain, I'm pretty confident I've got an understanding on it. And there's enough research on this that I think that this is right. So let's go back to this whole evolutionary idea. The first need is this is going to be bad for me. This is going to be good for me. This is going to feel good. This is going to feel bad, basically, right? As organisms evolved very early, they became sensitive to pain. So you now had a network of nerve cells that was very good at detecting things that caused pain because that's a bad thing. Pain is a sign that something's going wrong. The way evolution works, 
is very efficient. It doesn't tend to invent new things, certainly not quickly. And we see that at the level of, of for example, protein function in cells, that you have a protein that, that does one job, but with a little technique, a little tweak, it can do another job. So here you're going along through evolution, and now you get into the space of social animals, let's say. And you want to have an ability to respond to social stimuli that are so critical. So for example, a species like mammals or birds, where survival is dependent upon the interaction with the mom. It's very evolutionarily useful to have mechanisms in place that are, where's my mom? Where's my mom? Where's my mom? This hurts. This is a bad experience. And for mom to, where's my babies? Where's my babies? This is a bad experience. The brain doesn't do that by building a whole new mom bonding network. It says, oh, wait, oh, we've got this circuit here that we use for pain. And this is another kind of pain. So we'll just patch it right in there and we'll use it for this other purpose. Turns out that people have studied this in multiple areas, but the one that I, I found find particularly intriguing is they've done studies on people who have had romantic breakups. And one of the things that's really effective at helping people feel better after romantic breakups is aspirin, ibuprofen, Tylenol, painkillers, going into the same circuitry. So the idea that there is a link between pain, manifestations of pain, makes a lot of sense. So you can easily see that if you have emotional pain and physical pain coming into the same circuits, things are gonna get amplified. That's one, one possible way of thinking about it. Another way is that our limbic system, which is our danger, danger signal system, our harm alarm system, that evolved a long time ago, pre-verbal. Our limbic system does not talk to us in words. It talks to us in images. And it's so, I don't wanna say, it's not, it's not that it's primitive, it's so different that your limbic system can't even tell the difference between what's real and what's not. And we all know that. I mean, we, we relive these good memories and bad memories and they feel very real to us. We experience the emotions again, even though whatever's happening is nothing, it's just going on in our heads. So how does your limbic system communicate? Well, David and I have been batting back and forth a little bit the idea that the reason why physical symptoms often have a resemblance to hidden emotions is because your limbic system is saying, this is what you got to pay attention to. And what does it communicate with? It communicates in metaphors. It doesn't have words. So maybe part of what's going on is as simple as your limbic system is saying, I'm in pain, I'm in pain, I'm in pain. And I'm not going to distinguish between emotional pain and physical pain, which is what a lot of people who do lower back surgery for chronic pain have been finding for some time now, which is that it's much more effective to treat lower back pain with cognitive and behavioral therapy than with surgery for many, many people. So I think that that, that may be a part of it. So IBS, evolution again. I don't, again, you know, all this stuff, I have no idea whether, um, being interesting or hallucinating. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand stuff. Something very interesting happens when fight or flight is activated, which is that you evacuate your bladder and bowels. 
Why? Because that takes a lot of, if you're going to run or you're going to fight and you've got a full bladder, full bowel, you know, you're carrying weight, you don't need, and you're spending energy, you don't, you can't spare. So that's a very early response. And what's associated with IBS? Anxiety. And those chemicals that are released in anxiety seem to maybe have these effects. Now, I don't, you know, I'm trying to understand this. What's striking is the cognitive and behavioral therapy studies on IBS are pretty effective in a lot of people. So that tells you there is something going on. How does it work? How does it work? And it's, it's a fun thing to try and, and think about. I don't think it, everything is magic and nothing is magic. Everything is magic because it's magic that we're here. It's magic that things work. It's magic that we have birds and bugs and each other and all that. But it's not supernatural magic. It's not magic trick magic. Well, magic trick magic isn't supernatural magic. It's not Harry Potter magic. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah, thank you so much for giving us so much insight into chronic pain and IBS. And um, again, just always moved by your heart and passion for this work and for learning and for sharing it with all of us. Um, and uh, Rob has had his hand up for a little bit now. So let me go ahead and um, open it up to questions from the rest of the group. Would that be all right for you as well, Dr. Noble? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm here for you. Okay, great. Um, okay, Rob. All right. Hey, thanks, Diane. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? Long time Hi, no Zoom. Nice to see you. <laughs> hey, you too, you too. Hey, so listen, um, I've worked with a lot of people who are barely literate and stuff, and I've worked primarily in groups. And I'll, I'll tell you, I think there's something very concrete about working in a group, people speaking and people being witnessed. Uh, writing this stuff down on a whiteboard and checking that it's right and stuff like that. And so there really isn't the amount of individual writing uh, that you see uh, in your classic team approach, right? Yes. And I, I, there are kind of examples of this uh, all throughout uh, the ebook and kind of in 10 Days of Self Esteem, why that was created, that workbook. Um, it's it's really much less writing almost than you normally find and i i really wonder if especially in a group because honestly you see a lot of one-on-one -on -one team but a group is is quite an amazing experience it's like having more than one therapist but in reverse and i really wonder if that that really might be as effective be, i don't know because of the witnessing because um, uh, people are making sure that what's articulated is right and stuff like that. So um, I know you're really big on the writing, but I can't tell you it's been very effective with people who can't can barely write, but uh, are getting all sorts of support around what they're articulating. You know, I, so. uh, Rob, I could. That's such a good question. I I could not agree with you more. I mean, that we are, we are a social species. And so much of what we do is based upon the information we get within our social network. And emotions are so contagious, which is one of the, the, the important um, aspects of, of, of empathy that I know that you're, you are super good at. And um, others are super good at and others have, have to learn, which is getting the emotional matching. And, it, but the emotional matching with control on your part, so that you're gonna shift it into calm and happiness. So like, for example, in, in relapse training, 
I think there's a huge difference between saying, okay, so you know, relapses are, are can be pretty scary. And um, you know, a lot of people are very scared about them. But but we have some powerful tools that we're going to teach you to help you with relapses. And that's perfectly fine. But I love the way that Matt May does it with a big smile and saying, I've got some good news and some great news and some really great news, and then conveys this enthusiasm and this confidence. When you're in a group setting, which I know that you're able to pull off really well, and you can get people in synchrony with each other, yeah, they're going to reinforce each other, and it is going to be spectacular. And I, David loved all the work that he used to do in group settings. So I do think that that's another way to do it. And I'm so glad that you you had that experience. Yeah, I, I, there, there, I don't think there's any force more powerful than being within a social group that's helping you move in a particular direction. Unfortunately, that's true if you're going to join a dangerous cult, but we can harness it to our benefit in terms of trying to give people uh, an emotional peace of mind, which goes back to the barber shops and why they may be so cool is because you have these conversations going on in a group setting where you're getting this reinforcement. I think it's a wonderful idea to explore. And I have to ask you, are you riding a horse? <laughs> No, no, that's me uh, in my natural motion as I walk, uh, as I walk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, yeah, sorry about that. I hope I'm not making anyone sick. Pretty flower tree and cool hat too. Let's open it up to any other questions from the group. You can type it into the chat and I could read it out to Dr. Noble or you could just open up your mic and ask him. Hey there. Got a quick question. Hey, Diane. Hey, Richard. Great to see Hi, you. Hi, Mark. Um, I've spent many years in the area of um, vaccine safety. And so as I started to learn more about team, it just dawned on me that it seemed to have some correlations in the same way that a vaccine works, both from a therapeutic vaccine and a preventative vaccine. And I can imagine that this is already, I can see it's flooding your mind with ideas. And so I'm just gonna kind of leave it there. Where can you see maybe some correlation with the fundamental ideas about how a vaccine works? Oh yeah, I, 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 I love that. There, there was a, in one of the versions of what I was writing, I had a whole section on that, that uh, one of my daughters said, oh, take this out and no one will understand what you're talking about. That that I think what we're doing is we're creating very much a cognitive immune system. That when, so the way a vaccine works is that primes the immune system to be responsive against a particular pathogen. We're priming our cognitive immune system to be responsive against a pathogenic thought. So what do we have ready to do that? We have our, okay, I have this feeling, what is my limbic system trying to tell me? What are my negative thoughts? What are my positive thoughts? What are my cognitive distortions? And to me, that's like a cognitive immune response. And that in fact, if we can teach people how to do team before the wheels come off the bus, that we're effectively vaccinating them against these problems. And, and as you're talking about vaccination, I hope that we can also vaccinate them to be more immune to um, distorted thinking that pushes people in, in directions that disparage um, science as one thing, education as another, uh, different communities as another. So, because I think that it's all part of that. It, it's this ability to say, you know, actually that's not an accurate thought. And it might even be bad for me. And that seems to me to be a large part. I, I, I think that vaccination is a, is a, I don't know whether it's an analogy or a metaphor because I never understood the difference between them. 
but um, maybe it's both. But I, I'm totally, totally in, in sync with you on that, I think. Well, of course, there's the preventative vaccine, which you described. But there's also yeah. the concept of the therapeutic vaccine. Say, for example, therapeutic vaccines for cancer that are being looked at, in which you go in and you look at an existing problem or existing cancer cell, and you understand it very well, and you create a vaccine that can then go in and solve that problem. And it seemed yep. to me that what's happening here possibly is you're starting with a kind of therapeutic vaccine in team. Yep. And then in doing that, you're also creating a preventative vaccine for the time in which wheels fall off buses. It happens. Exactly, exactly right. Because nobody comes to you until they're at the point where they need the therapeutic vaccine. Which is part of the reason why I'm really interested in how do you get this information into the school systems so that we're doing the preventative vaccination? Great. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, great question. Shara's just saying that's beautiful as, as an analogy and looking at creating a cognitive immune system. I think that's a pretty cool analogy. Um, yeah, and there's a question here, um, Dr. Noble, what is the mechanism behind resistance at the level of the brain? So at the level of the brain, we, we know, I, don't, I was going to say very little, but that's rapid, there was rapid thinking on my part. So I caught myself that part of the problem is that we know too much, but we don't know how the pieces fit together. So there are, I have not been able to find any studies on resistance that help me understand it in terms of processes within the brain. I, I've been looking for a while and you know there, there certainly are papers on resistance, but they tend to talk at a psychological level, which means that it's, you know, it's still floating in this disconnected space from, from brain function. So I'm, I'm, boy, I'm wrestling with that. And I do think that resistance, I have a feeling, an intuition, that resistance is connected to fight or flight. They add, as I listen to people, and, and this could be a confirmation bias, but I think that as people give different examples, whether with older clients or with young children, and when I think back about our, our, our own uh, parenting, resistance was, you're going to take something away from me. I wanted, you're taking away, it might be you're taking away my choice. It might be you are going to ask, as Rob says, you might be asking me to do something um, that I really don't want to do. Um, so I, I wonder about that. But that is going to be, um, that's going to be interesting to discuss. And Richard, yes, I, you just sent me a, a note. And I'm going to say that I would love to talk about this. I'm going to say that and, and all of you, any of you can send me emails directly and I will do my best to respond. If it, if I don't respond right away, it's, it's because of the, you know, the, the other stuff I have to do in order to pay for my laboratory and pay my graduate student stipends and things like that. But, um, but yeah, I, I love these, these conversations. Because it's so important that if we can understand this, we're in a better position to cause an inflection point. So I, th I, th I think that what Team CBT is, is a disruptive technology with everything that that implies, including the resistance, right? So why are people resistant to team? Well, we all know some of the reasons. One, it's hard to learn, it seems. Two, can threaten your financial structure. I mean, my colleagues at, at my medical school, when I've talked to them about it, it's like, are you crazy? If I treat three people in an hour and give them each antidepressants, my department gets $600. And if I treat one person with CBT for an hour, I charge $150. What do you think the medical school wants me to do? 
So there's all these reasons for resistance. And the more we demonstrate how well this works and the more we're able to talk about it, the more we can get to that point where things flip. And of course the app is gonna be a powerful force in that. And, and um, you saw, that th I think all of you probably saw the data when, when David and Jeremy talked about the app on one of their podcasts and how well they're doing now. And I just got a note from David this morning that the second beta test is even better than the first one. And the results are even more powerful. Linda, you're, so, you're, you're disillusioned by something. I'm just, I'm, I don't have my chat box open. She said, now I am disillusioned by such a noble profession. Oh, Linda, don't be disillusioned. It's, we, we go into these fields, many of us go into these fields with hearts of gold. And we have to earn a living. I mean, and, and if you're in a country like the United States that does not have a decent healthcare system, you have economic forces that impel you to behave in a, in a certain way. I mean, maybe in a, in, a, in a group that allows you not to worry about that, but often not. You have the stories that people tell you, right? You have the pharmaceutical companies saying, oh, this stuff is rubbish and our drugs work. And when you look in detail at the studies, well, actually, the drugs don't work so well, but gosh, they have powerful voices and there's nobody who's going to spend a billion dollars getting out the word on Team CBT. So what's great is that we have Team CBT. We have growing numbers of people who, like yourselves, who are becoming skilled in this and are helping people. And the word spreads. And I can tell you from my own experience, and I, I'm... I'm not a therapist. I would love to be a therapist. And I, I just, but I have this lab to run and these other things that I'm doing. So I just haven't, I don't been able to find a way to do that yet. But I teach this stuff to people. And students come to me because they know that I know this stuff and they want to, they're anxious and they're depressed and they want to get an idea of what to do. So I say, look, I'm not a therapist. I am not going to be your therapist, but we can sit down for a couple of hours. I want you to buy Feeling Great and read some of it, and I'll teach you how to do this. And so far, everyone I've done that with, I have completely treated in one session. And they all say, oh, my goodness, you are... I had therapy throughout college or I've been doing therapy the last two years and we just accomplished more than we accomplished with everything else that I've been doing, including the drugs. And then they go out and tell others, just like your clients go out and tell others and put things up on, on Yelp and other social media and say, wow, this, this is really different. It's really great. And, and, it's, and it's very important, Linda. And, and everyone. So Linda, because you brought it up, I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you this question that we all encountered as kids, but may have forgotten the answer. Here's the question. You have a pond and there's a type of algae that gets into the pond. It's just one single cell. And that algae divides once a day. So every day it doubles in the amount of cells in the pond. And on day 30, the pond is completely filled with algae. On what day is the pond half filled with algae? And most people you ask that to do rapid thinking and say, well, day 15. But it's right, as Bridget says, yeah, it's the day before. It's the day before, day 29. 
that is how what looks like gradual change suddenly becomes rapid change. That as we get to the point where we are making enough of a presence that more people are seeing what the possibilities of Team CBT are, we are changing the nature of that pond, except we're doing it in reverse instead of the bond succumbing to algae and eutrophication, we're cleaning the pond up day by day. And all of a sudden we get at the point where we have a clear pond. And I, I have great faith that that's gonna happen. Partly because I get to work with people like all of you. And the need is so great and we don't have other options and the drugs don't do it. And the other ways we approach therapy don't do it. And this approach changes people's lives in a very science-based way that hopefully between the app and between the kind of stuff that I'm doing and the kind of stuff that I hope others are gonna start doing and writing about this and, and people that I'm trying to get interested in doing imaging studies that we can create a sea change because goodness knows we, we need it. So, so Linda, I think that the, 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 it is often hard to be optimistic in this world, but there are also reasons to be optimistic in this world. And uh, one can never give up on that optimism. Um, thank you, Dr. Noble, for that note of hope. I think that's so important. Um, Cheryl has been patiently waiting with her hand up as well. Thank Cheryl, you. hi. Hi, thank you, Tyann. Um, so I, I have I have way more to yammer about than I, than I will take time to do, but I wanted to ask about this idea of resistance at the, at the level of the brain and um, my, uh, I, I love um, Lisa Feldman Barrett's uh, How Emotions Are Made. Yes. Um, I actually read yeah. that before I heard your podcast with David and I said, yes, yes, yes. Cause when I have read her book, I said, that's team. That's why team works. And then yeah. you did your podcast and you completely validated that that connection for me and, and it was just beautiful. So um, shout out to her and um, you're pulling those pieces together for me. But um, the resistance piece, it, it seems to me is the organism's way of being efficient. Um, we as an, as an organism being efficient in doing fast thinking, which is less energy, less of an energy drain. And if you are depressed, or have yes. chronic pain or yes. overly anxious, which has taken an incredible amount of energy. So if you're depressed, you have no energy because you're telling yourself you're hopeless. And so there's no need to expend energy. If you're gonna be, if something is hopeless and, and you have nothing to work towards, then as an organism, why would you expend any energy towards something? So it reinforces the, the lack of doing, which is one of the beauty, beautiful aspects of hopelessness, right? We can tuck in, we can not yep. do, we can relax, we can tell ourselves there's no reason to do anything because it won't change anything anyway. Um, Absolutely. And so, does that make sense? To me, that's the idea of resistance is it sort of maintains our organism's um, most important survival mechanisms, which is to not waste energy. And, it, and, it's, and it's a predictable outcome. Absolutely. Oh, and, and look, I, and I want to say, I, I am very honored that you put me in the same sentence as Dr. Barrett. <laughs> Isn't she amazing? She's amazing. She's, she's yes. amazing. And, and she is the one that talks, I mean, she is the one that just blew my brain around that our brains are, are developed for movement. So this is how I explain this to my clients, that our brains are developed for movement. And so in order to move through space, we need to predict what's coming next. You need to yeah. know that the sidewalk is going to consistently be what it looks like it's going to be in order to move smoothly, right? And, and the analogy I use is that if I'm walking in Minnesota, which I try not to do in February, but I do, I do most years walk in Minnesota in February, and all of a sudden you hit ice on the sidewalk mm -hmm. and you have to correct. Yep. 
and that's the same idea as that as that corrective thought process like oh wait that's a distortion i need to correct and you know and so so it's that same i not maybe not making sense but it's that same process from a cognitive standpoint as it is from a physical standpoint we have to move through space we need to predict what's coming next we do yep. the same exact thing cognitively we're constantly predicting what's coming next and we're feeling yep. as though that prediction were accurate and in order to change something you have to change it in the moment and that requires energy it requires energy so it better it be worth it yeah and and it requires taking a chance yeah and, why would and you do maybe that your prediction is wrong here you have this prediction that okay you know if i stay like this I'm miserable, but I know what's going to happen. Exactly. What if I change? What's going to happen? Right. So resistance is the most efficient thing that we as an organism can, can do is to continue yeah. to do what we've always done, which is that fast thinking. Anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet, but I appreciate your work greatly. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Okay. And Rob had his hand up as well. Oh my gosh. Oh, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to get called, but, um, yeah. Um, oh boy. Uh, well, you know what? Um, it, it's so funny because, um, I, uh, I think, I think, um, really if, if you frame resistance and a lot of this stuff as avoidance, um, it, it's easier to, I, I think it's really like the most primary defenses. I know people talk about fight or flight, but really, Freezing is sort of, I can't, this is such a, I, I shouldn't be saying this stuff, but, um, uh, you know, if, if you get fired at with a gun it, it, and, and you're plastered on the ground, you cannot move, you know, if you look at animals, whether they're a predator or they're prey, they freeze first, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I think if you don't deal with stuff, it, it, um, it, it is the, the easiest thing to do to not deal with stuff. And, um, I was also able to get rid of like uh, all the somatic pain I had by seeing, uh, framing the, uh, using the work of Dr. John Sarno, which frames yes. uh, the, the, um, the pain as a defense uh, against uh, untenable unconscious emotion. Yes, and it, it, it worked for me. I mean, it, it was amazing. Um, and so I've kind of used that same thing to reframe stuff and sort of you know thank stuff for not dealing with it because maybe i'm not ready to deal with it i i i, I you know i i was surprised i got called i i have a feeling i just said total gobbledygook so i apologize but um i'll send you an email mark <laughs> oh always, always a pleasure and, and and i'm always so charmed by the way that you you've you you worry about whether you're you're talking gobbledygook but you always say stuff that's so interesting so I, 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 you know, I, I think that it's right. I think that, you know, what, what is resistance? No, I don't want to do that. Well, if there's a, I don't want to do that, there's a reason why you don't want to do it. And it could be you're going to give something up. It could be that things are going to become unpredictable. It could be that you think things are going to go badly for you if you do it. Yes, Linda, fast thinking and video game addiction. Absolutely. That is the heart of video game addiction. Getting into that, that the fast thinking and the dopamine reward that you're going to get frequently, which is another thing. You know, it's interesting to try and tie all this stuff into the other areas of neuroscience. So I, I don't, you know, even though I don't even though I think antidepressants are a load of cobblers, I think that understanding the dopamine system and noradrenaline signaling and, and cortisol effects and things like that are really interesting. And when you look at, at the way the dopamine system seems to be a part of anticipatory reward, I guess is a language that people use, that's a lot of what we set up in team, right? Oh, I just had this part of session where uh, this negative thought revealed all these good things about me. 
I wonder what the next thought's going to reveal. I wonder what good things I'm going to find out there. So we do have a structure that gives a lot of this reward. And one of the things that I love seeing in people in when we're using the playfulness of methods is the joy that, that people have as they learn to do this stuff, the real, the real pleasure that they get in this. It's really fantastic, which I know, I know you've all experienced. And it's just a, you know, those are, those are real emotions of pleasure and, and, and being thrilled with what's happening. And if we understand what's going on in the brain at all, we're gonna say, well, yeah, boy, they're getting, they're getting quite a dopamine rush out of that. Yes, healthy team addiction. Absolutely. Let's be addicted to healthy thinking. Mental health is a practice, and this is how we practice. Yeah, we have time for just one more question. Um, wanting to really respect Dr. Noble's time, and you've invested almost two hours of your time and knowledge and wisdom with us. So, did anyone have a burning question they? wanted answered before we wrap up for today? And if the spirit of the staircase strikes you and you, you know, two minutes after we, we end, you think of one, just send me an email. Yeah. Or send it to the group and we can discuss it in the group. That's been one of the great fun things that mm. we do in our, in our Wednesday group is that a lot of emails circulate to everybody we get into these interesting discussions. Yeah. Linda, okay. has, Linda has one more burning question. What okay. about ADHD? Wow. So David's take on ADHD is you cannot get team CBT or anything to work unless you medicate because you cannot get a focus of attention. Yet talking with multiple friends who have ADHD, what they tell me is that they actually don't have any problem with focusing their attention. The problem they have is that once they get their attention focused on something, they can't change it. That the, what happens to them is they get locked into doing a certain thing. So they just keep doing it for hours and hours and hours and hours. It's hard for them to, to switch. They get a lot of pleasure out of that. Um, and it's also a safe space. Is there something different in the chemical balance in the brain? It sure looks like there is. And, and maybe, and as you say, maybe it's a dopamine tolerance. But, but one of the things that I, I've, I've learned is that there are facts like some of the insights of the Buddha, Stoicism, that are really solid. But most facts aren't like that. And what we call facts disappear. The half-life of a fact in physics is particularly powerful, lasts maybe 45 years. Half-life of a fact in psychology is about seven years. Things change really quickly in what we think is true. And being interested in the nervous system for some time, I've seen the way that we that our, our thinking continues to change for these neurotransmitters. You know, dopamine was the movement chemical and then it was the pleasure chemical. And now it's the anticipatory reward chemical. And they all have components of truth to them. And they caution me to, to always be aware that sometime in the near future, there'll probably be another step in that pathway. So I, I get, I get confused trying to understand this stuff. And also because I, 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 so far I have not found the kind of information that helps me think about it. But my goodness, I think that that's so, that things like ADHD and, and um, bipolar disorder and the emotional fragility 
of, uh, um, now I'm forgetting the, the name, I'm blanking on it. Uh, the one that, that all therapists hate to work on, borderline personality disorder um, and the emotional fragility there. What is going on? So interesting, we don't know. Hopefully we will know. But in the meantime, we've got all these people who we can help with all these other problems, which is so cool. Okay. Um, yeah, that was so great. And this whole session has just been so enlightening. Dr. Noble, just uh, immense gratitude uh, to you and your heart for this work. And just thank you so much for your time and doing this voluntarily. We know you have a lot of important things to do, but taking your time out of your day to just connect with us and educate us and share your heart with us has just been so valuable. So thank you so much again. And um, yeah, seeing lots of you're thanks all, in the chats as well. So I just- You're, you're all so kind. Thank you so much for, for being interested in this. That, that is really what, what drives the, the continued interest that at any time I you know I see that that switch in someone's face of oh yeah that's an interesting way to think about this that's mm -hmm. a reason why I might do it that way that yeah. makes it all worth it for me <laughs> yeah you're a true teacher at heart and you uh, find meaning in people just and engaging and having insight about the world. That's just really cool. Yeah, well, you're all on the side of the angels and that's the team I want to bat for. <laughs> yes, thank you so much again.